Welcome to the Northern Business Podcast. Each week we talk to people active in business and the economy about the big issues driving growth in the North of England. We're sponsored by Virtue Motors, one of the UK's leading motor retailers, and you can check out its website at virtuemotors.com. That's V-E-R-T-U motors.com. I'm Graeme Robb. I own Recognition PR. We help scores of businesses promote their products and services, and some are featured on this podcast. Don't miss any episodes by subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, today I'm going to be speaking with our sponsor, the first time he's been on for months, Robert Forrester, CEO at Virtue Motors, and also Aman Shahal, who is the CEO at Roofing Specialist Tapered Plus. But first, Robert, thank you for joining us, and also thank you for your sponsorship, but we'll still probe you and ask you how your business is going. There's um, a lot going on in the car and motor sector at the moment, particularly with the advent of the changing criteria for electric vehicles. Bring our viewers and listeners up to date with where this government currently stands. Yeah, um, they've introduced uh, a fining regime for manufacturers to incentivise electric vehicles to be a higher proportion of overall new vehicle sales, Um, which sounds fine until you get into the detail. Um, Effectively, the manufacturers have to sell 22% of their new cars as battery electric vehicle this year. That rises to 28, and then all the way to 2030, you get to 80%, with a ban in 2035. Slightly strange, because effectively you got 80% ban by 2030, but then a full ban in 2035. The Labour Party then actually want to accelerate that ban to 2030. The fine, if you actually, as a manufacturer, don't get that mix right, is every car over, every petrol and diesel car you sell over your quota, as it were, is a £15,000 fine per car. So very, very punitive. So the industry is actually really struggling with this. Uh, The natural demand for electric vehicles is not in keeping with these targets and unlikely to be so. The cost... Uh, reductions that were anticipated in the production of electric vehicles haven't come through yet. I'm actually quite confident they will come through, but they haven't come through yet, Uh, potentially apart from China, because the Chinese do appear to have a major cost advantage on electric vehicles. So we're in a situation where the manufacturers are not making money in terms of selling electric vehicles in the UK. On top of that, they're faced with massively punitive fines, somewhere between a billion and two billion this year, And the thing just gets worse as each year goes on, uh, unless electric vehicles take off uh, to a massive degree, which, to be honest, no one is anticipating. Okay, let's unpick some of that. Now, we're uh, broadcasting this on Wednesday. There's a general election tomorrow. If you're listening on the recording, it's just 24 hours before the election. So this week, uh, Rishi Sunak, as Prime Minister, was asked about the uh, chief executive of Stellantis' comments on this. Now, Stellantis owns a vast proportion of vehicles that are sold in the UK brands, things like Vauxhall and Peugeot and so on. And she said, according to the BBC, that moving the electric vehicle um, cut-off date to 2035 was dampening demand. But actually, uh, perhaps the BBC were not uh, uh, expressing it correctly, I think she probably meant the Z mandate on cars needed to follow the ban and be rephased. What, what's your interpretation of well, what the brands are if saying? The B- if the BBC were right, then she'd be happy if the ban moved from 2035 to 2030, which I am guessing she wouldn't be. Because actually what her boss, Carlos Tavares, has said, and in fact what Maria Grazia said last week, is that Stellantis, Peugeot, Citroën, Vauxhall, Fiat, Alfa, Jeep, uh, all those brands are struggling to make money in the United Kingdom because they're having to heavily discount their electric vehicles to stimulate demand. Mm. And the fines, uh, which are very, very substantial, um, are causing them major problems. And if you think about the economics, what is actually going to happen, in her, and I'm sure is in her mind, is let's reduce the number of petrol and diesel cars we sell, which are the profitable cars, in order to get our electric vehicle mix up to 22% or 28% next year, which means I'm going to make even less money. Yeah. So I'm having to, di- you know, the manufacturer, I'm to discount electric vehicles, not sell them all the profitable ICE cars. And hence why she said that, you know, there were the viability of the plants in the UK, Luton and Ellsworth, were under threat. And, and I suspect this is just the start because clearly 
entities aren't foreign uh, owned companies are looking quite quizzically at the UK and saying, why do we want to be here when the government is purposely going out to make life very, very difficult? Is the answer then for a government of whichever colour to go to the 2035 date to rephase the Z mandate on manufacturers and to align with Europe and even North America, which is it hasn't set the date in the same way, but it's got a longer time for phasing in electric vehicles. The irony of the situation from what I can see is that Europe is actually starting to move in completely the other direction. It would not surprise me at all if the 2035 day was moved to 2040, mm. actually, in Europe. Uh, the rise of, of, of people in governments who are not committed to net zero in the very short term, I think they're probably committed to decarbonisation over a longer, longer period because of the economic damage it might do to industries like automotive manufacturing. And the slightly irony we have is that we've got most of the major political parties, with the exception actually of one, who who want probably to accelerate matters rather than uh, elongate them and have a more of a transition. When Rishi Sunak made his announcement last October about moving from 2030 to 2035, his key argument was he wanted to put consumers in charge so consumers could make rational decisions and that ultimately would mean that we'd have more electric vehicles because electric vehicles were a superior technology, they'd be more cost effective and that's the general uh, direction of travel. Uh, the actual rules that have been based just cut across that completely. I mean, it's just that argument just hasn't hold, held water. He is actually effectively putting petrol and diesel cars off the road in terms of new cars, hence why the manufacturers are worried about it. We've got Europe potentially moving in a completely different direction to the UK in what is it, an integrated European car market. I mean, we are absolutely integrated into the European car production market and our manufacturers treat us as, as a continent. Um, Which is, I suppose, the reason that Nissan has uh, has decided it will invest in the UK at such a high level. Uh, In November, it was £2 billion worth of investment in Sunderland. Uh, It did, and and I don't suppose it envisaged that it was going to get charged £15,000 a car if it overproduced Qashqai uh, as a petrol uh, petrol car. So, And then I think the other interesting thing is then where the Chinese fit in this, because it strikes to me that... The Chinese have a cost advantage in terms of production of electric vehicles. They've got massive scale. The European Union have just done an investigation into effective dumping and and put massive tariffs on the uh, Chinese electric vehicle battery and car manufacturers. The US, by the way, did that about a month ago and put 100% tariff on. And we're now sat in the UK waiting, obviously, for a government and waiting for a view as to, you know, what's going to happen. Because you could see if there's high tariffs in Europe, high tariffs in the in the US, um, and big overproduction in China, then actually if, if there are tariffs in, coming into the UK, then uh, the Chinese will clearly try and take a su- substantial advantage of it. And actually, there are some people who say if net zero is going to be reached by these very accelerated dates, then actually Chinese cheaper electric vehicles of high quality could be a route to it. I mean, what is the, the, what is the differential, Robert? I mean, if you take a European-produced uh, electric vehicle um, in one of the big stables and a Chinese electric vehicle, a sort of the BYD yeah. or or even MG, what kind of differential are you talking about? The current view is around 35% differential electric vehicles. Mm. So substantial, yes. let's be honest. I mean, Ch- China makes 77% of all electric vehicle batteries in the world. Uh, it's got the largest car market, the largest electric vehicle market. There are substantial economies of scale. And my probable view is I've got an electric vehicle. Nothing wrong with electric vehicles. They tend to be more expensive than petrol and diesel ones. That lies the problem. And the t- pace of technological change and development isn't reducing that at a swift enough rate mm. for consumers to see even parity or an advantage. And you can't just keep asking manufacturers to cut costs of to cut the price of things when they're not making any money. Uh, And economic reality will come through. You can see it in Europe now. The whole agenda is about about protecting the the automotive infrastructure that we've got in Europe. Uh, And we are are quite a long way behind the ball on that one in the UK. Okay, so when viewers and listeners hear the phrase Z mandate, zero emissions mandate, that doesn't refer, refer to the phasing out of the ability to buy a vehicle. It refers to this fine system, which is not 
uh, it's running it's at the same pricing. Yeah, pricing petrol and diesels out the market. I mean, that's broadly what you, what it's going to do. It's a manufacturer mandate, not a consumer yeah. mandate. Okay, yeah, now absolutely. Robert, if you didn't have this electric vehicle uh, issue, um, which is clearly a big issue and growing issue in in motor uh, dealership circles, how is business going generally? How do you see the economy and demand for new vehicles in terms of car demand? It's actually pretty good. Um, I think it's much stronger in fleets than it is in private retail, and that has a lot to do actually with electric vehicles because people get tax advantages for for having an electric vehicle if you're in a business you do, uh, in terms of very low levels of taxation. Uh, there are no incentives to buy electric vehicles on the retail side, so retail is fairly weak. Uh, fleet. Uh, volume's very strong. I think we're going to see quite a seismic shift, actually, in the next six to 12 months. I think we'll see a much reduced, uh, potentially, new car market because of these fines. You can't really understand the car market, really, without understanding that as ever Monday. In terms of demand for vans, I think the economy clearly has slowed down in terms of growth, and that's coming through, I think, in the van market. It's okay, but but not uh, pulling up trees. The one area of our business, actually, we have seen quite a significant slowdown in line with the rest of the industry is in motorbikes. Mm. Um, and it's quite interesting looking at motorbikes in terms of, their, you know, they're a leisure product in the main, big bikes. Yeah. And I think as people have uh, had to reprioritize potentially their spend with high inflation, et cetera, et cetera, we have seen demand um, certainly not in growth mode, that's for sure. Um, and the big bike market has probably had oversupply, I suspect, for the past 12 months. Now, Robert, you obviously are sensitive, as you've just said, to retail demand from the private sector on leisure. What about the element of it that really does count for affordability, and that's interest and loans? Quite often you have to buy a vehicle uh, for the family. You will need to put it on finance. Uh, do you see in any uh, in any uh, way things like the lower interest or zero interest uh, finance coming back? We haven't done any interest rate reduction, so the answer to that question is clearly no. Uh, what we have seen is finance getting more expensive over the past 12 months as, as rates have gone up. Clearly, we're expecting, along with everybody else, rates come down, and at which point the cost of buying a new car and a used car will go down because those lower base rates will feed into lower uh, APRs when you come into a dealership. So I think uh, we are more confident, actually, that consumer demand will pick up. We we haven't seen much of an effect of the um, of the election campaign. Historically, election campaigns have, have led to uh, people just stopping and waiting to see. I think because this is broadly a foregone conclusion, it looks like. I, I don't think there's been an effect of that at all. And actually, football competitions, interestingly, also normally lead to uh, demand going off because people concentrate on watching England, but England is broadly so miserable that I don't think that's had any effect either. Um, so, yeah, it's fairly steady actually in terms of in terms of overall demand. I think used car demand is stronger than new, and I think that's just an affordability issue. And finally, Robert, if I move away from the market itself and into your business in the northeast of England, where you've chosen to locate, you are probably the largest business by turnover in the billions of pounds. Uh, you employ thousands of people. What measures are you taking to innovate in your business? What what is the? Uh, it's a constant moving feast, I should imagine, to keep on top and keep growing. I mean, uh, one of our number one priorities is. Um, to make sure that we have a stable workforce because actually having people who know what they're doing and enjoy working in the company is is the big job. I mean, that is that is our number one job. And, and we're seeing much better stability, actually, um, in terms of um, a, a lot of the colleagues in the group. Our stability indexes are going up. Uh, we have 56 software developers and we, we are seeking to get more productive and get better customer experiences, but particularly around productivity, by utilising technology. Um, to make our people more productive. And actually, if we're going to see real wage growth and greater wealth as a country, then we clearly have to use technology to make everybody uh, more productive. Even I am using it. I'm now using AI to do email drafting, for example. Um, and AI is an interesting subject, but I don't think it's a one-way bet at the moment. Um, so we've got a lot of thinking to do around that. The, the fundamentals about our business, if somebody walks into Teesside BMW or Stockton Honda, do they see the same people? Are they given a great welcome? Are they made to feel that we treasure them as customers and do they get a great experience? And technology 
can sort of help, but it doesn't really help. 99% of that experience is the people-to-people interaction. Um, albeit the websites are clearly very, very important, the online journeys. But our major thing is to make sure we've got people who are motivated, who enjoy what they do and know what they're doing. And that's, that, as ever, will be our prime focus. Well, Robert, thank you very much. And thank you for sponsoring our podcast. Very upfront that uh, you are our sponsor. And, uh, and uh, all the best for the coming months. Thank you for joining us. And now in the Northern Business Podcast, I want to turn to Aman Shahal. Now, Aman Shahal is the founder and he runs Tapered Plus in Teesside. Aman, it's great to talk to you. And uh, the last uh, uh, podcast of our season, we've got great news from a, a firm that's really developing new products, your firm. Just remind our viewers, because you've been on before, what it is you make. Yeah, so essentially, Graham, we're a company based in the Tees Valley region that designs and supplies tapered insulation schemes for flat roofs. Now, these schemes have really taken off as business premises owners want to reduce heat loss through the roof. And you're doing a lot of retrofitting, aren't you? What kind of level of uh, growth have you had? Yeah, so um, we're we're growing around about 40% every year, and we've got quite an ambitious growth plan in place as well. Um, Retrofitting is the top of the agenda for a lot of building owners. Uh, The price of energy is soaring through the roof, literally. And uh, 2025 onwards, we fully expect changes in legislation, which will drive our growth even further. Yes, because commercial property is going to have a similar kind of assessment, isn't it, as uh, far as um, um, environmental credentials are concerned, that domestic property has? Yeah, sure. If there's a building which is F-rated or below, um, by next year it'll be classed as unlettable, which is about 14,000 buildings just in the UK that need to be upgraded. Um, that's going to change to B rated or below by 2030, which means a further 30,000 buildings will need to be retrofitted. That's fun. It's, a, these standards. it's a very tough standard and a very big opportunity for you. Now, this opportunity and the performance of your business so far has led to a brilliant investment um, and you've received a, a cash injection from another investor. Tell us about that and how it's come about and what you're going to do with it. Yeah, so we, we brought on Core Capital in 2020. They couldn't be the end of the cycle with Core Capital. So we brought in a mid-market private equity firm called BGF to help uh, support our growth ambitions. We really want to get involved in digitization, work in AI, and um, drive growth not only in the UK but abroad, and really invest in our team, our premises, and uh, upskilling our entire team to take advantage of the opportunity. It's a very healthy investment of over £5 million. And was it easy to achieve? Did you have to go through some kind of Dragon's Den-style pitch? Or, or do you think that you were, the, you were the, the prospect for them? Did they have to pitch to you? Um, I think it's a bit of both, Graham. Um, it's important for us to find the right investor, but also for them to find the right company to invest in. They've got to believe in the growth and the journey, and it's the same likewise for us. We've got to believe in them as a, as a company, as an investee partner, and, yeah, it's all about the partnership and alignment. And what do you think the company will look like in a, a year or so's time? Well, the plan is for in the next three to five years, we're in for us to treble in size. Um, we really want to be aggressive out there. We want to be the go-to in new build and retrofit, specialist in non-combustible and, uh, yeah, really, really drive the, drive the market and be market leaders. Well, Amant, thank you very much for talking to us. And can I just say congratulations on a brilliant deal uh, that shows the style you've got in business is shared by investors and just what we need in the north of England. And a great way to end this series of our Northern Business Podcast. Thank you very much. That brings today's Northern Business Podcast to an end, but we're going to take a pause now for a couple of months during the summer. We're back on the 11th of September, and if you want to join us, please get in touch via LinkedIn or in touch with Recognition PR in Darlington. We're looking for interesting people to interview on the podcast, which is broadcast on my LinkedIn channel live every Wednesday at 5pm, and it's also broadcast on YouTube And it's also recorded and put on audio podcasts on Apple, Spotify, uh, and um, also Amazon. Now, thanks to our podcast producer, Harry Sinclair, and our technical operator, uh, Robin Campbell. Join us again in September for more from the Northern Business Podcast.